Hello, I'm Nicholas Kraft from uh, the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa, and I'm actually accompanied here today by uh, 15 uh, students that are performing research uh, this summer. Uh, three are actually students at UA, and 12 are research participants from across the country, primarily the southeast, although we have someone from the Bronx. Uh, hey. All right, so um, today I'm going to talk about, uh, the title of the talk is Improved Code Clone Categorization, but really the, uh, the bulk of the talk is just kind of an overview of uh, research going on in code clones uh, across the world. Um, and then towards the end I will get into some of the work that we're doing at Alabama. Um, Mike Rains, uh, one of the students in the crowd, is actually uh, helping me out on this um, for very little pay. <laughs> so. Um, the outline of the talk, basically a brief introduction, uh, some motivation, and then we'll get into uh, cloning and software, and what do we mean by this, uh, moving on to clone comprehension and what it is and why it's important, uh, then a little bit about what we're doing at Tuscaloosa, one of the clone-related projects we're doing at Tuscaloosa, and then a few concluding remarks, and I included some reference slides in case uh, anyone's interested in learning more. So, start out with introduction and acknowledgements here. Uh, I actually have two collaborators. Uh, Lee that's born from uh, UAH, uh, uh, Alabama and Huntsville, and uh, Jeff Carver, who's also faculty in my department, and Mike Rains. And of course, our sponsors, the National Science Foundation and the uh, Stimulus Package and uh, Department of Education. So, um, Co-clone research, you know, the, the purpose behind it is it's, it's a software maintenance problem, and software maintenance is costly. Um, so we always like to find big numbers that we can put up to, to get people's attention, like up to 90% of software cost is spent software maintenance. Of course, that's up to 90%, and your mileage may vary depending on the project. Um, but as of 1995, is the most recent estimate I could find that related uh, to actual dollars. Uh, the estimate was about 1% of the GDP, which of course the GDP has grown greatly since then, and I don't know if the estimate of software maintenance has kept pace, but again, these are just big numbers meant to uh, get your attention and say software maintenance is important, and that's why we're studying these problems. Um, as most people can probably uh, relate to, we think that software maintenance is difficult uh, due to the size and complexity of modern software systems, um, and uh, another estimate here, from 50 to 90 percent of the time performing software maintenance is actually spent um, trying to comprehend the system that you are maintaining. So, um, of course, you know we have a developer mobility issues in general in the software industry. So we have new people joining the team, and they need to learn a piece of software so they can begin making changes, whether they be bug fixes or feature additions, and. Um, you know, if, if you've not worked on something for a month, or if it's Perl, if you got up and went and got a cup of coffee and you come back and you no longer can comprehend uh, the code you're looking at, uh, you know, that's a problem. So this makes software maintenance difficult, and uh, hence a lot of research on program comprehension these days. And finally, software maintenance is risky. Um, you have to maintain internal consistency within these systems, and systems are interrelated, so we can't just make a change to a software system and assume that change occurs in isolation. We have to worry about uh, how that change will propagate throughout the system. And so today the clone research primarily is uh, hits on these points. So we're trying to reduce the overall uh, cost of software by reducing the effort that people have to spend uh, maintaining software. Um, the way in which we're trying to address software developer effort is to reduce the time and effort spent comprehending a program. And with clones, we're specifically worried about internal consistency. And this will begin to make sense as we learn about what clones are and, and what people have found related to clones. So, uh, moving right along, uh, some terminology. So a code fragment, when I say code fragment, I just mean any sequence of source lines. And that could include comments, um, just statements, any any sequence of source lines, contiguous uh, sequence of source lines in the program. And we could be talking about different granularity levels. We could be talking about you know, two statements within a method. We could talk about the method itself. 
a class, a file, a package. Um, you know, it's it's variable, but we just mean some snippet of code. So code clones are actually similar code fragments, and similar is a metric which we get to define. So similar could be exactly the same, character for character, or it could be uh, similar in relation to some uh, metric that we can compute. And we'll get into this a bit more. Um, when we talk about clones, so we're talking about similar code fragments, we can have two similar fragments. So uh, fragment A and fragment B, and they're similar. Uh, that's called a clone pair. Or if we have, say, three fragments that are similar, that's a clone group or sometimes called a clone class. So three or more segment or fragments of code similar would be a clone group. Um, we have different types of clones. These can be clones based on the syntax is similar. So the form of the code fragments are similar. That is, um, you know, if we have C++ and we have two for loops, the, the syntax is similar. We might say those are clones. Or we could talk about, and this is a little less common at this point, semantic clones, where we have the syntax is not related, but we're performing the same action. And we'll look at specific examples on these slides. So uh, researchers have divided um, code clones up into what they call four types. Types one through three are related to syntactic clones, and then we throw all of semantic clones into type four. And these are somewhat loosely defined. Um, you know, in general, we agree on what these things mean, but um, you know, different tools that detect these clones uh, implement these things in different ways. So uh, there, there's certainly some variability. But in general, a type one clone is when we have the exact same code except some white space and possibly comments have changed. So on the top here, we see uh, well, the original code fragment, or code fragment A. And code fragment B is identical character for character, except for we remove two new lines and replace them with a single white space. And so this would be called a type one clone. Any change in white space, any change in comments. A type two clone builds on type one, so we can have differences of white space and comments, but additionally we can have names that have been changed. So any identifier in the program, whether it be a type name, a variable name, so on and so forth, uh, they can be uh, changed and we consider these two code fragments to be type two clones. So here you see the, the class name is different and we've changed a parameter name and thus all the uses of that parameter have changed. Um, just any identifier uh, could change and this is a type two clone. Sorry Dr. Kraft, um, GPR is saying that they're having trouble hearing you so they want to make okay. sure that your mic is on and that it um, didn't go off or anything and that the lapel is maybe a little bit higher. Okay. How's this? It's it says it's on. Yeah. Does the fact that the battery light is not on mean it's dead or mean that it's not? Yeah. Let cost? me take that and get fresh batteries. Not good to it. Okay. Type 2, we can have differences in white space, comments, and identifiers. And now we can also add or remove statements. So this is where we start to get some variability in the definitions because you know how many statements can we add or remove and still consider it a clone? This is currently just a parameter to the various different tools or algorithms that are out there. And you know, there's no there's no set definition. But here you see we simply added a statement, an if statement wrapping uh, one of the existing uh, expressions, and this is a type 3 clone. And as you can see, it builds on a type 2, we've still got a different name. So, building. So now, type 4 clone is deals with semantics, not syntax, or syntax. Um, and here you see that we have the same algorithm expressed in two different ways. One, the original code fragment above uses an iterator, and the code fragment below uses you know, the accessor, um, the overloaded uh, square bracket operator. And 
you know, we're doing the same thing, but the syntax is not completely different, but significantly different. Okay, and the detection of these clones is uh, still in its infancy compared to syntactic clones, because there are a number of different issues here, as you can imagine. So, um, code clone detection. How do we actually detect these code clones in our software? Um, there are a number of different techniques. Uh, you can basically partition them into four categories. Uh, Text-based techniques, which just consider a program to be a sequence of characters, and we're comparing uh, you know, the raw text in the program without regard to uh, the specific language constructs. Um, an example of that is dupe, which uh, Brenda Baker, I believe she's at IBM Research, um, came up with this in the mid-90s. Um, Token-based techniques, um, much like a lexical analyzer, break the program up into tokens, and then you move a sliding window across the token stream uh, looking for uh, similar, um, similar you know, sequences. Um, CC Finder is actually probably the most commonly used and well-known code clone detection tool out there. It's actually fairly mature for a research tool. Um, it's from a research group in Japan. Uh, they have uh, not only uh, you know, the, the core uh, you know, code clone detection, uh, but they have a GUI that does various kinds of analysis. And it's, it's, it's a reasonable tool. Um, Syntax-based methods work similar to a parser, so we parse the source, build a tree representation, and then we're comparing subtrees. An advantage of the syntax-based techniques over the token-based is now we don't get weird clones that include the end of one method and the first two lines of another method. You know, they break you know, across uh, method boundaries. That doesn't make much sense in terms of um, you know, the, the actual program structure and meaning. So with syntax base, we can only try to compare subtrees that represent a, an entire method or an entire for loop or whatever the granularity we're looking at. Um, so there are some advantages here, but of course, when we're dealing with subtree matching as opposed to token stream matching, we get slower. Um, uh, Semantics-based tools are primarily used to detect semantic clones. Uh, the most well-known, I, I don't think it's the only, but it's one of very few tools out there, is Duplex. And it builds a program dependence graph, which is a um, typical compiler internal representation. And uh, the disadvantage here for de detecting syntactic clones is that you abstract away a lot of the program structure. You're just maintaining the meaning. And so it's obviously difficult to uh, detect similarities in structure if you've abstracted that away. Um, but of course, you are maintaining the meaning, and so we have a better chance of, uh, of detecting these uh, similar, uh, you know, similar meaning, different, different syntax with these techniques. Um, and again, these are even slower than the syntax based, because now we're looking at subgraph matching as opposed to subtree matching. So with any of these different techniques, we can use different similarity measures to uh, determine whether two code fragments are in fact similar. And again, we can use a very basic, um, are they exactly the same? Then yes, they're clones. We can do, um, for syntax base, for example, we can do hash values for the subtree and compare the hash values. And if the hash values are within uh, some threshold of each other, then we say they're clones. And uh, these similarity measures are often, actually, they're basically always parameterized in these tools. So you can you know, set the threshold and change the type and amount of clones that are actually detected. So for token-based, you t commonly set the minimum, uh, minimum window size. So how many tokens, uh, what's the minimum number of tokens that can constitute a clone? 30 might be a typical value. Um, if you bump that up to 100, you're going to detect less clones, which may be a good thing. Um, and if you, you know, push that down too far, you're going to detect lots and lots of clones. And all of a sudden, every for loop, you know, the header of every for loop begins to be a clone because, you know, they're extremely similar in terms of the tokens. So, um, you know, parameterization of these, uh, there's been uh, a lot of anecdotal evidence that one parameter, you know, one token window size is better than another, or one threshold um, between comparing hash values for these subtrees is better than another, but there hasn't been a lot of study here. Um, basically, uh, we tend to follow each other's lead, which 
We could be propagating good or bad information, it's hard to say. Um, so that's future work, obviously. But again, there are lots of different detection techniques and tools out there uh, that allow you to make various trade-offs. So some empirical results to show that um, these clones exist in the wild, which perhaps is intuitive, but um, you know, some experiments have looked at, for example, the Linux kernel and determined that 15% of the code, the 4 million lines, is actually uh, duplicated in some way. Now, this may be the most obvious of all these examples because when you think about the drivers subdirectory, um, all drivers have a basic framework and in particular if we look at all printer drivers, they're going to look fairly similar and especially if you know how these developers you know, create new drivers, they take a driver for a device that's similar to the one they're writing the new driver for and make some changes. So. Um, Nevertheless, 15% is not a small number, so it might be a, a bit surprising. Um, other uh, studies have looked at different versions of the JDK um, and JHotDraw, which is an open source uh, drawing uh, toolkit for, for Java. Um, and you see varying levels of cloning. Uh, people have actually looked at, as well at uh, some COBOL systems and found numbers closer to 50%, um, which you know, I don't know that much about COBOL, but uh, hearing that it co comes out the worst is maybe not surprising to me from what I do know. Uh, I think 50% cloning is, is probably uh, undesirable. So anyhow, these are just uh, results that people have, uh, you know, come up with as they're testing their tools and techniques and to show that, you know, these clones do exist in the wild and they are a real issue. If you're maintaining a code base where 15% of the code is duplicated in some way or another, uh, you should know about that if you're going to be making changes. So uh, clone comprehension. So first of all, what is it? It's knowledge of the existence of clones, first of all. Uh, do you know that there are clones in the system? If you don't know that, you, you can't comprehend them. Uh, knowing where they are in terms of, uh, you know, in the broadest sense, you know, we have clones, you know, high concentration clones in the driver's directory of the Linux source tree. Um, you know, that's, uh, you know, some kind of coarse grain comprehension, uh, knowing that a particular subsystem, whether it's split across multiple packages, if it's cross-cutting concern, knowing that that concern has lots of clones involved, maybe that's uh, valuable knowledge. It's kind of context dependent. And then finally, understanding the relationships between the clones. And this is what we'll, we'll focus on a little more through the following slides. Uh, so first of all, some motivation. The kind of canonical example here is that uh, a bug report is filed and we identify a change that needs to be made to address that bug. And we're going to go apply that fix. And the question is, after applying that fix, have we actually resolved the bug? Okay. If the bug affects a cloned piece of software, then maybe, maybe not. Um, we should at least uh, be aware that there are clones and inspect those different clones to be sure that this bug does not uh, affect those clones. So um, here is uh, some data from Argo UML, which is a open source uh, UML modeling tool available from, was it tigris.org? Um, and here are um, some activities. So the first activity was inserting a new statement. So you can see in March 2002, uh, the developers inserted a new statement in class diagram model. And they came back in August 2002 and realized they should have added that statement in a related class deployment diagram model. So there was a clone there they didn't realize, and so the change uh, that should have been made in two places was actually, we created an inconsistency there for about five months, which we presume is a bad thing. Um, similarly, uh, we're fixing a bug make the first change in October 2002, takes us five months or four months, I guess, to realize you know, we should have made this in a separate place as well, so we didn't actually resolve that bug uh, until four months later. So, you know, these are just two examples of, yes, uh, you need to know that clones exist because it can affect uh, the quality of your system. So, um, current approaches to actually comprehending these clones. As you can imagine, going back to the Linux example, um, 4 million lines of code, 15% of it is cloned. Um, 
Okay, that's an interesting fact, but that's not really actionable. We're well, not going to go through a database of 15% of our code looking for every single clone every time we make a change. That's not, uh, not reasonable. So, you know, one approach to helping people comprehend these things is to provide a visualization. So when you're making a change, it allows you to quickly kind of get a feel for, am I working in a piece of the system that has clones and has a high concentration or a low concentration of clones? Um, and you can see here a typical visualization, which your mileage certainly may vary with the scatter plot. Um, you know, the tool actually does allow you to kind of zoom in and click on things. Um, but regardless, you're getting a very coarse, coarse grain view. Um, a system level view. You're not getting an actual, well, here's a piece of source code I'm working on, and here is another piece of source code that's related, and, and I can look at the relationship. Um, all I can take away from this really is trends and characteristics of the system in general. And yeah, it's hard for me to even say what that means. I know that a diagonal line of dots means there's some clones, um, but that's about all I can tell you about that. Um, so, um, a different approach is to categorize these things and try to take that, again, going back to the Linux example, take that 15% of code clone and, or clone, cloned code and um, abstract that even further such that we can actually have actionable information uh, that is usable in our day-to-day -day, uh, activities. So people have looked at three basic ways to categorize these things. Um, and let's take a look at the, the image First, um, here we see um, clone classes or clone groups. Um, so, for example, clone class one there is uh, four code fragments that are clones of one another. Um, and what we've done here is, you know, we're grouping these different clone or categorizing these different clone groups, uh, kind of clustering them together, and trying to say that the clones in clone class one and clone class two and clone class three share some property. Um, and, you know, so we're just trying to abstract information, um, get a higher level view. And uh, one way to do this is lexical properties. And I'm going to stretch the definition of lexical here and say that, you know, we might categorize these things based on these clone, uh, clones in clone class one are found in the same directory as those in clone class two and three, um, in the same file, um, things like that. Uh, people have also looked at syntactic properties. All of these clones uh, in a particular category as shown here might ha involve a for loop or involve um, some other program structure. And finally, semantic properties. And here we're talking about a different kind of semantics. We're talking about human semantics. So that is, all of the clones in one category might have the same identifier name present. And that identifier name might, might represent a type or a method. Um, you know, but the idea is that if the same identifier appears, we're referring to the same concept, and it may be useful to know that that concept uh, appears in clone code and in different places throughout our system. So the semantic properties is actually, I think, the most promising research in that, um, you know, other than finding that, you know, this particular directory has a lot of cloning, people have actually found some interesting uh, interesting relationships using semantic properties. So, for example, in a study of the Windows NT kernel, um, some researchers who are actually now at my institution, they weren't at the time they did the study, um, they discovered that, you know, there's different, I think, three or four distinct ways to allocate uh, a particular uh, memory for a particular purpose in the Windows NT kernel. And so, because of the, uh, you know, the use of the same identifier name in the different methods, they actually found that, okay, we have clones of this allocation method and clones of this allocation method and clones of that allocation method, but actually they're all doing the same thing. And we discovered that via simply the use of the same identifier um, in the different sets of clones. Um, and, you know, the advantage of this is, other than that it kind of, you know, identifiers are very, easy for humans to comprehend, easier than, say, program dependence graphs. It's also fairly lightweight computationally, uh, particularly in comparison to some of the, uh, some of the other techniques. So, uh, any questions? Is this, is this pretty straightforward? Okay. Um, so, now I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing currently at Tuscaloosa. Um, this is a National Science Foundation-sponsored project. We're actually 
in the first, really in earnest, we're in the first six months of the project. It's a three-year project. So this is just kind of where we're going, uh, what we've been doing, and, and what our plans are. So uh, what we want to do is create an analysis process that's automated, first of all. So I'm, I mentioned those results on the Windows NT kernel. The clustering was automated, but the discovering what the cluster was telling us, that there were three different uh, allocation you know, methods, that was done manually, so just by inspection. So we would like to automate some or all of this. Um, and we want to use structural properties as opposed to simply lexical, syntactic, and semantic. And on the next slide, I'll show you exactly what I mean by structural properties. Um, but we also want to use these semantic properties because there is some promise there. And in particular, we want to combine uh, the two using structural and semantic. And we think that'll actually help us uh, do some of this analysis in an automated way that was previously done you know, manually. So the major tasks we have are uh, figuring out how to structurally categorize different uh, classes or groups of clones, um, improving on uh, current techniques that do semantic class or categorization, and uh, actually combining those two, and then doing empirical validation of all of this. And empirical here in the sense of actually studying humans uh, using these different techniques uh, within their normal workflow and seeing if we're having a positive impact. It's, it's easy to say that you know, what we're doing is better because you know, we have a bunch of numbers, but um, that's, that's different from actually being useful. So, um, so uh, task one, the structural categorization is actually something that I'm leading uh, and that Mike and I are currently working on. Um, and here we want to use uh, static, basically static program representations uh, that, that, that uh, uh, okay, that, uh, uh, sorry, uh, static program representations that have to do with the, the structure of the program. Um, three basic types of program representations that we're going to look at are flow graphs, so things like call graphs which uh, encode caller collie relationships, um, control flow graphs, which, again, are just what they sound like. They kind of represent the flow of control through the program. Uh, we'll look at dependence graphs, including data dependence graphs and control dependence graphs, uh, program dependence graphs, as I mentioned earlier, and class graphs. And this could be, you know, we'll start with class diagrams. You know, what are the relationships among classes and how can we, you know, use those to um, you know, discover interesting properties of our clones. And uh, we actually want to, to help automate this process, we want to define metrics uh, for these different program representations that capture how they're similar, you know, how an instance of a, this call graph is similar to an instance, a, you know, separate instance of a call graph, and how they're different. And, you know, a lot of the research, for example, on call graphs has allowed us to uh, compare two gra call graphs and say, you know, do they contain the same information? Uh, but that's different from actually capturing uh, to what extent and in what ways they're similar and in what ways and to what extent they're different. So that's actually, uh, you know, a reasonable, reasonably difficult uh, challenge that we're going to be dealing with. Um, this just shows some of the different program representations we'll be looking at. I mentioned call graphs, control flow graphs, uh, different dependence graphs, which are along the bottom. Um, you know, interprocedural control flow graphs, which you, know, you take a control flow graph for a method or a function and link them together using the calls you find in the call graph, so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, task two is, is primarily being carried out at UA Huntsville, although I'm participating in this. And I think this is actually pretty interesting stuff if, you've not, uh, if you're not familiar with this. So this is kind of uh, really kind of creating a, a search engine, a clustering engine for our, sor our source code. So um, I'll go over the process in a moment. Um, but you know, basically, the first thing we're going to do is, is take the, the study of the Windows NT kernel and replicate it using a different information retrieval technique. Um, some preliminary research recently has discovered that latent semantic indexing, which is a very uh, kind of lightweight information retrieval technique, is, uh, is effective at capturing a certain dimension of your data. But latent Dirichlet allocation, 
which is a probabilistic method, is a little more advanced, a little more heavyweight, uh, actually captures a separate dimension of the data. So first of all, comparing. Yeah. So just comparing the performance of these two uh, techniques as well as looking at combinations of these two techniques to try to capture you know, both distinct dimensions that, that we believe these techniques are capable of capturing. Um, and we want to augment the structural categorization using these uh, information retrieval techniques um, and the semantic properties. Um, so again, we want to integrate these techniques in both a serial and an integrated manner. So we do structural categorization, then semantic, vice versa, and then integrate them in such a way that every time we, uh, tr we have a decision we, we're going to make in the structural categorization, we also consider some of the semantic information. Um, and that's pretty far down the line. We don't really have concrete ideas. We have some concrete ideas, but not many about how we're actually going to do that. That's actually a hard problem. Um, but the process here, the generic process for kind of uh, uh, clustering source code based on the identifiers is it's, it's simple, but it's, it's actually been found to be very effective. So we take our source code, and in our case, we'll run it through a clone detector to get our clone groups. Um, and then we will do semantic extraction on those clone groups. So we'll get you know, documents uh, that represent each clone group, where a document's just a list of words, you know, a list of identifiers that appear in those different clones. And those identifiers could come from, again, type names, variable names, string literals, comments, et cetera. So we're going to create these documents, one for each clone group, and put them through an analyzer that implements a particular information retrieval technique. Again, uh, LSI is a pretty common, lightweight one. Uh, the way that works is you uh, create a term document matrix. So you have your documents along the top of a matrix, and each term that appears in any document as the rows, and you put some weight in each cell. It could be 0 or 1 if the term does or doesn't appear in the document. It could be um, you know, 4 if this term appears 4 times in this document. Or it could, be call, uh, it could be term frequency, inverse document frequency, which tries to uh, weight uh, you know, the number of times the term appears by how common it is across all documents. Um, in any case, this is pretty simple. We just create the matrix. Uh, run singular value decomposition over it, and we basically have a bunch of vectors, and we can take the angle between the vectors. The smaller the angle, the more similar two documents are. So two clone groups are most similar if the angle between them is zero after we've done this LSI process. Uh, the LDA process is probabilistic. It's a, it's a bit more complex and expensive to compute and a bit harder for uh, me to relay because uh, I'm not a math person. Uh, there's lots of uh, sigmas and uh, <laughs> pies and various. Uh, at one time, I could have understood it, but n maybe not anymore. Um, anyhow, it's just a, an alternative method for um, coming away with uh, a model that we can use to compare two documents, or in this case, clone groups, to say you know, how similar they, similar they are in terms of the identifiers that are used. Um, and that's really the clustering part, is going through, comparing all our documents pairwise, and determining which ones are similar within some threshold. And again, the threshold is something that you, know, you have to determine, at this point, basically ad hoc, and then see if it, it holds across different software systems. That's kind of where we are with this research, we being the, the general community. Um, so. This is semantic categorization. Uh, this has been done to some extent, but we're looking to improve it by using different combinations of information retrieval techniques. Uh, challenges for these first two tasks. Uh, one kind of mundane challenge is actually mapping these code clone results to that, back to the original source code. Um, these code clone results, for example, token-based, they give you uh, ranges of tokens in a particular file. And then you have to go figure out, well, what do they consider tokens, and on what lines do they appear? And it, it, it's not a difficult problem. It's just uh, annoying more than anything else. And then when you move to, OK, well, let's look at a different tool. And now we have to analyze its results and try to map that back to the source code. It, it, it's a challenge in that it's a lot of work, uh, not in that it's terribly difficult. Um, 
a difficult uh, problem here is how do we handle code fragments? So in particular, if we're building a static program representation for a code fragment, uh, most of these analyses that we use to create these representations are designed for whole programs. So do we create the whole program representation and then try to extract the piece uh, for the code fragment, or do we try to compute it directly on the code fragment? And then once we look at, you know, uh, you know, computing a metric, do we compute that metric on the whole program graph and extract that? I mean, it seems like it would lose meaning without that context. Um, how do we alter it to, uh, to be more meaningful in a code fragment context? Uh, these are actually fairly difficult problems. And then finally, integrating these distinct strategies, uh, combining structural and semantic categorization. Again, it's not entirely clear how you do this. Um, for example, if you're looking at call graphs and you're categorizing based on call graphs, um, you know, one obvious thing to do would be say, well, all of these clones in this group and all of these clones in this group call the same method, or they call a method that calls a common method. And how do identifiers fit into that, or, or do they? And um, how do our results differ across different software systems? And can we uh, kind of uh, characterize different software systems to say that, yes, this combination will or won't be effective based on, again, some metric? Uh, so these are uh, fairly difficult problems, numbers two and three here. And then, of course, we have to evaluate these things. So once we get these presumably different categories than we did with, a, with an existing technique, how do we actually show that our categories are better in some way, more meaningful, more useful, and, and that's where the human studies come in. So, so far we've actually done some preliminary studies uh, with students, graduate students at both UA and UA Huntsville. Um, we've also done uh, the study with some professionals. We have a research center affiliated with our department in Tuscaloosa that has about 30 full-time staff. And in Huntsville, uh, a lot of the students are actually professionals uh, working on, you know, for de defense contractors and such. Um, so uh, we've basically been studying them in terms of, you know, how do they use clone information and what can we uh, distill from the clone information that would be useful to them in performing various tasks. Um, we're actually, Beverly is in the process of analyzing some of this uh, data from the study we did in the spring at the moment. She's loving it. Uh, um, so the goal here is to go beyond anecdotal evidence and actually get some, you know, observing developers in the context of, of performing a task and uh, being able to, you know, qualitatively or quantitatively say that yes, this did or didn't help and to what extent. So finally, um, progress where we are. We've been working on structural categorization based on call graphs initially. Uh, the next step will be control flow graphs, which might be the first time Mike's heard this, that that's the next step. Um, and we've been doing some comparisons with LSI and LDA and, and combinations of those, and we'll also be looking at combining those in, in a serial process with the, the call graph structural categorization. And we did a preliminary study, a human study. It was a bug localization task. Um, and we provided some clone information and trying to see how people used it or if they used it. And we actually have a related project going on. One of my other PhD students is looking at code clone management techniques. And this is actually uh, pretty interesting stuff. So people have come up with, okay, we detect the clones and maybe we analyze them and have some way to uh, make that information more useful. But now day to day, um, I know about the clones, I can comprehend them, but you know, how am I managing those? Am I doing it interactively, such as, you know, I'm in my IDE, um, I add a clone, you know, does it detect that and, and pop up something? I mean, or is it stored in a database? I, I don't know. Um, you know, if I change some code and I no longer have a clone because of that change, or, um, you know, the type, it was a type 2 clone, now it's a type 3 clone, um, you know, how can we, you know, people are looking at how all this information uh, can be used in an interactive fashion. Uh, other people are focused on what we're calling reactive uh, techniques. So that is, um, every time we have a code review or every six months, we run a clone detection tool and we, you know, make some adjustment 
based on the fact that we do have clones or we don't have clones or we have this many. Um, and then we go back to uh, presumably, you know, not caring about the clones until the next time we uh, react and you know, run a code clone detection tool. And finally, proactive, and this is where, this could be a reactive or an interactive technique can be proactive. And this is where uh, we find clones and we, we kill them. We refactor them away. And this used to be, originally this was the idea. We find clones and they must be bad, so we remove them. And lately, that's been called into question. I mean, the most obvious case is we had a clone, but it was necessary for performance reasons. You know, we can't afford that, that function call an embedded device. So um, that's led to people thinking more and more about when is a clone good and when is it bad. And you know, that's, a, that's a hard question to answer. It depends on context. It depends on the particular system and the properties of that system. Um, but people are looking at this and trying to build evidence for, uh, you know, how we can look at a clone and say, yes, it's, it's good or bad, um, or even can we do that? So uh, my PhD students actually, he did a big review of all the literature, came up with these, this kind of taxonomy, and he's actually going to look into interactive code clone management techniques because he thinks that's uh, the most promising. So. Um, thank you for your attention, uh, and if you have any questions or comments, I'd be happy to address those or talk about those at this time. Yes? Sure. Okay, so first of all, let me give proper attribution. I didn't do that. Uh, someone else did in the literature, just to make that clear in, in case this comes up. <laughs> but, um, you know, that the tool they used was CC Finder, and um, it's token-based. And actually, you know, token-based techniques are pretty quick because there's not a lot of pre-processing. We're just tokenizing. And then we're just moving. We, you know, we take a token stream that represents one code fragment, and all the token streams that represent the other code fragments, and we just kind of move the window and say yes or no. Um, still costly, you know, probably talking about um, hours rather than minutes there. Um, but they have implemented a dis distributed uh, version of it, and that obviously runs a lot faster. Um, you know, because we're doing a lot of pairwise comparison, we can parallelize a lot of this. You know, it tends not to be the case because these are academic prototypes, but, but you know, some people have looked at that. It is, um, it is possible. Now, when you get into tree-based techniques, uh, depending on how you're comparing the trees, uh, you can get, you know, in terms of days there. Um, although, again, people have looked at some work at UC Davis. They actually take the subtrees and they uh, compute a hash value. You know that's unique for each subtree, and then they do comparison of hash values, and that you know it's still slower uh, perhaps than token-based because we are parsing the source code to begin with, but you know not not the worst. Sure, I think a, a bigger issue is. Um, at least to me, is, okay, yes, we can go out and detect all these things, and now if we're looking at interactively managing these things, we have to have something that's reactive in an IDE. And, you know, these this data sets, <laughs> at least to me, uh, can be pretty, you know, pretty unwieldy, um, you know. Yeah, you know, it, to be perfectly honest, you know, I, I've I've done a lot of work with with um, front end systems for doing various static analyses, and it to some extent amazes me how quickly Eclipse or Microsoft Visual Studio can work, you know, on a, you know, a local manner, uh, you know, having to constantly recompute these syntax trees and and update. Uh, so anyway, that's. Uh, it's not that much harder of a problem, I don't think, or much more computationally expensive than what they're already doing. 
Yeah. Sure. Any other? Yes. Sure. Yeah, and you know, um, yeah, uh, I think that you know the goal here obviously is to get this this stuff integrated into you know uh, all these development tools and you know every, people's everyday processes. Um, you know, the reason I decided to present some of this today rather than. Uh, my work on uh, grammar engineering, which has to do with uh, refactoring uh, context-free grammars based on metrics, is is that I, I think this is more, uh, you know, this is more immediate in terms of this is stuff that can be integrated kind of now um, if we have the tools, as opposed to some esoteric research thing that is kind of uh, interesting but not particularly useful in a day-to-day -day context. Well, thank you very much for coming. I appreciate your attention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.